so that is like it's a it's well, i was just having a conversation with a woman outside she's an english teacher uh, or a teacher for young children and trying to explain what the word the is and how it works and it's it's always a precursor so it's it's like it's a word that has no other purpose other than looking after other words and it's always a lead in so it's like a a guide or a chauffeur or whatever it is so for me i wanted to make the a little bit more prominent it is a funny word but equally it's it, it's always delivering something or it could be delivering a question so i wanted to isolate the on its own um for the large sculpture of deliberately given more space below it like there's something missing so the the what um but it's also the the word is there's two lowercase and one uppercase and the t is lower the h is uppercase and e is lowercase so when you pronounce it that's not always just the it could be to he so it's a joke so it's a little chuckle when you look at the grounds you've got two large sculptures and the building the vivian in the middle so it's the the vivian idiots so in a way i am stringing a really naughty sentence through and it wasn't deliberate but when i when we put that in the subtly the the new signage on the building it, you know you re, you can't help but read it into something and i think that's the need of having the you need to follow it with something else So I've I've always written poems, and um, they've been really an important part of my life. Where I, when when I was engineering, it was mathematics and materials and building sites, and so I needed. I used to go to drawing life drawing classes, and I used to write poems. I'd never publish them or anything like that, and I never thought anything would come of them. Um, then I went to art school and uh, the words crept into my art practice and now they're a really solid sort of skeletal form for them. And the poems suddenly had more recognition for me and I think I had more time writing them so I, suddenly I had a more cohesive um, group of poems that worked together. Uh, so for in the show I, I started writing some poems and I started making the artwork from it. And then what happened, which I wasn't expecting after I made the shelf works, there were a number of poems which came back to me from the artwork. Um, one of which is in the back of the book is called Muriel Wallace, and then, so that's a poem about my grandmother and weaving. And it's about an actual object of ours that she, we own and that she um, made back in the 70s, early 70s. So poetry is a big part of my art practice now. And I, I wasn't expecting it. Weaving with Muriel Wallace. In our hall, with its tall walls, hangs a weave of wool interlaced to form geometric shapes. My grandmother made it, and it went to Japan in 1971. We are lucky it did not sell. We are lucky it hangs outside our bedroom. Like a talisman for our safety, while we sleep and our brains unwind. Weaving is a fundamental thing. The crisscross repeats like a mantra, but physical and silent. When we look, we know who made it. The big repeat for us today is getting up and going to work. The radio and its static like hiss on politics and the popular. Right, middle, left, lift the warp, then let the shuttle leave the weft. And when it's done, insert a length of thin bamboo through the woven hoops. When it's done, tie the tassels on the end, white, blue, purple, brown. When hanging, they will point at the ground. Walk past it every day at least twice. It will tell you this, you live, you sleep, you live. Yeah, so the felt works, um, w when I started making them, they were working from the poetry, and it was also about the material materiality of felt. Um, I remember seeing a Joseph Boy's artwork in Edinburgh, um, 
and it was one of his brooms and it had a brass handle and it might have silver coated uh, broom head and then on the bottom of the broom it had felt and I just thought what a beautiful mix of materials. Um, so it's always been in my head to, to make some felt works after seeing that one. But the big important um, realisation of these works for me was after I hung the first couple up on the wall in my studio is it really kind of me, it made me realise how far these works had come and they go all the way back to me as a young boy learning how to weave and spin from my grandmother Muriel Wallace. So the felts to me have come a long long way which A gives me comfort which reflects the material but equally, I, I didn't see it coming. I didn't see that relationship coming. I've always thought a lot about my grandmother and the way she taught me how to weave and spin from as a young boy. So always this practical act of making a craft. It's you know being a, and it's also a fundamental thing. We wear clo you know clothes, blankets, all of those things that sometimes the process of making we don't always consider today because of machinery. Survivalist. All our false gods and idols meet today to discuss the worldly and unworldly matters of us. We will wait outside the doors and sit on the steps. Our hands will cradle our chins. Some of us might gently rock. Others might pace back and forth. We can only hope they see us as simple things, needy and sometimes charming with his fault. When do you think we stumbled off the path? Did we overdo our slip knots? Did we make too many sharpened sticks? Me, personally, I confess, I got obsessed with pictures of survivalist kits found on the internet. Is it too late to send another diplomat? It's just an idea, but we could offer to start again from scratch. Go back to simple grunts, drawing on rocks with charcoal sticks. We could promise to never draw anything abstract just hunker down with a future of literal fact. On my open blanket I lay out now, a leather belt, a hatchet, an axe, three knives of differing size, a flint, gloves, plaid shirt and cap, a wooden cup, a thin length of rope, a folding saw, a kidskin pouch and hand carved pipe, and finally a fishing line with hooks, all wrapped around a finger of whittled wood. So with the felt works, the, they went and ran alongside the, the poetry um, and in a more literal way. And then I was considering how in the choosing the words for the felt, I was basically breaking up language and reducing it down to uh, smaller sound bites and you know I just started thinking about texting how we just with speed and the ability of the reader to be able to read pruned language I thought about that that whole pruning process and I started off with an object in my studio in my at my lathe and it's a it's a a, a caliper but it's shaped like a letter 8 and I thought, oh, it's letter eight. It's like a visual language, just like we have emojis and things like that. So I wanted to use that kind of clumsy nature of an object becoming a letter. Yeah, so, so the shelves are unashamedly word plays. You know, they're, they're not a new thing. In a way, they're a game and they're, they're playful. They, the, I found drawings from both French and English and I'm not sure of the correct dates, but sort of 17th, 18th century, and they show figures, human figures, forming themselves to make letters. Some of them look incredibly dangerous and painful. Um, so I wanted to bring in the human figure into that as well. So it's a, it's a reference back to history. Um, it's also a reference back to modern modernism in terms of sculpture. Um, but the objects, the big thing for me was I've imbued in some of the shelves objects, tools that were my father's and possible grandfather's. So it's like I've, I've buried these objects into an artwork 
to kind of make them last, uh, the way an obsessive collector would. So the, the mobile that sits behind me is it's sitting in the middle of the gallery and I was really aware with the flatness of the felt and with the shelf works um, I needed some sort of a visual break in the room uh, that would also tie the two works together so with the, with the words but also the, the three dimensionality of it. Also the found chains like some of the objects on the shelves. Um, so from a mechanical point of view I needed a physical thing in the room but it goes beyond that it's it's also a, a, a poem and a word it's also a signpost it's like a warning to ourselves um, it, the words do dance around so it suddenly becomes unintelligible in part so in a way it's mechanically pruning those sets of words into new words for you so you're having to constantly try to piece them together the large carved microcarp man is is another little play with Colin McCann. When I was making the works, I was thinking about Colin a lot in terms of the way he used language, and he wasn't necessarily preaching, but he was certainly searching for something, some way of leaving something behind, uh, like in, in, in terms of a legacy, and also the way, um, in terms of the Bible, I guess that's 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 a, an enormous legacy of not just characters. Or people or stories or fables or meaning or historical events. So Colin McCann he wanted to leave things behind and uh, I also want to leave things behind. I don't have children um, so the best thing I can do is maybe to leave some artwork which might last a little bit beyond after I pass. And that's the brings you all the way back to the collector. The collector wants to save things and bring everything together and uh, make sure they don't disappear. We, she, he, gods. We are not long out of the cave. We came out in small groups and met on corners. We met where trees had fallen and had made useful clearings. We met when the moon held the whole stage and like the show off that it is, it encored every bloody night, and we clapped. In the interval, we drank and thought existential thoughts. We are not long out of the cave. Our feet are still in love with dirt and stone. Our dogs rule the edges of our fires, sizing us up and waiting to encircle us. They will get the best bits of our bones. It happened before, just read history. We are not long out of the cave, but we are so awesome. Don't forget the drawings Da Vinci made, the revelations and transport have come true. We have fashion, art, music and other things. We made the lovely drugs. We took them and still take them. I do not think there is a beginning, Stephen Hawking said, but his theory really gets into my head and all I hear is a bad drum beat. I feel he let us down, taking our hands and taking us only halfway down the path. Do you think we came out of the caves too early? We should have stayed inside and really learned how to behave. Be better at drawing animals and weird signs that really just mean who will cook tonight or maybe whose turn it is to clean the place. We left the cave and we got the disease. Taking pictures of ourselves and attempting self-praise. Chuck Berry's golden disc is heading away from us, a weird stupid discus with the Pygmy Girls and Beethoven, the ultimate playlist to mark our disappearance. But now I'd like to get poetic. At night, the light from the moon drips onto us, sometimes faintly through the clouds, other times it is like soft, gentle rain. Its massage rubs away all fear and memory, a massage that ignores the itch in all of us.